All right, we should be live. Scott, can you hear us? I got you. Can you hear me? Oh, we got it. There we <laughs> go. Uh, well, okay. Plus, man, about about the last plus one minus 15 seconds. <laughs> talk, talk about making an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> that is outstanding. All right, so I'm Ben Owen. We're here live with uh, retired Green Beret Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann of the 7th Group. We've got CIA officer and Green Beret Gary Harrington. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Netflix's new top 10 documentary, Spy Ops, starring none other than Gary Harrington. Um, I'm Ben Owen with Black Rifle. We have absolutely nothing to do with coffee and everything to do with data. We do data and digital media for the gun industry. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Gary to let you introduce yourself real quick. And then, Scott, you go and we can dive right in. Hi. Hey, I'm Gary. And yes, uh, I was a CIA officer uh, before that, I was a Marine officer a very long time ago, did four years in the Corps, then spent 20 years as an enlisted Special Forces soldier and went to the CIA for 10 years. And uh, they and I got chosen to uh, take part in spy ops and a couple other little documentaries that uh, the CIA has done in conjunction with big media. And hey, here I am today. Happy to talk to Scott and Ben. Love it. I, for, I forgot about the four years in the Marines. <laughs> well, you got to start somewhere. That's right. <laughs> Scott, you up? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Gary, it's good to see you, man. You know, when when you and I were, were, were talking at the end of the last week, I was just listening to your backstory. And, um, you know, as I listened to you talk about the journey you went on from, you know, Marine to SF and then case officer um, and then deployment after deployment into Afghanistan. And frankly, during some of the most formative years of the, of the Afghanistan campaign, I mean, like at a strategic level, the stuff that you were doing in the hinterlands was, was so impactful. Um, you know, I, I'd like to kind of start off with um, you were thrown into these places where it was so ambiguous, so complex. I mean, if you watch, if you watch Taliban spies, you know, you look at like just the audacity of that one operation. And, and, you know, if you look at your security force and the looks on their faces, even 20 years later, like it's, you know, it was, it was really uh, edgy, right? How much of your, upbringing and background you know so many of the iconic green berets that i've worked with particularly the ncos so, you know so much of their 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 background their their growing up shaped them how did your growing up shape you and 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 if so how uh, yeah you know our growing up shapes us all all right uh you know i, I i've looked at ben's story and, and and look at his growing up and how that shaped him or or any of us and and mine, you know, I, uh, yeah. I guess to be honest, I was a skinny, toe-headed, thick glasses wearing, loudmouth kid. You know, I, I was smart and scrawny, and uh, kind of always took like leadership roles from a, a young age. Um, but in my family, it was my family were you know subsistent farmer. Appalachian, you know, plowing the field with a mule people. And the stories I heard of real men were hardworking, quiet men. And I felt I was so the opposite, right? I, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I developed a, who I was inside was a scared little kid that suffered quietly from anxiety and how I overcame that was I watched, John, I grew up watching John Wayne and Audie Murphy. Yeah. And when, when yeah. I came, you know, I didn't learn anything about the military growing up, but then when I was introduced to the military in college, um, it was like, whoa, wait a second. You know, I'm, I know how to take punishment. I know how to be tough. I will never give up. I don't mind killing myself to achieve an objective so hey uh wait a minute if i'm willing to do that i can kind of like be like my heroes as long as i will go harder longer and risk more i can be that and not this 
scared person. And I think, you know, I, I hate to say it because it was there was a lot of fun and adventure and pride uh, and little victories along with all the sacrifice. But to be honest, I was chasing that dream to say, you know, to, to define myself as who I wished I was. Yeah. And and so that does form formulate who you are. And for some reason, with my upbringing, my background, I seem to do well in real ambiguous places, you know, to get dropped in with not many rules. OK, I'm a, a bit of an anti-authoritarian person, so I kind of like somewhere where it's really ambiguous so there's no rules so i can make up my own um i like to think to serve the greater good but yeah it probably suited my personality too and ego um and yeah so i mean those are driving factors my love for my country the my willing i i wanted to serve um and, and i have a innate empathy and compassion for my fellow man. So it really didn't matter what country I went to. I grew up with poor people and villagers. It doesn't matter if they were in Honduras, Panama, um, Yemen, Kuwait, or um, Iraq or Afghanistan. I, I enjoyed meeting them and I liked sharing part of their lives and liked, uh, you know, interacting with them. So that those all formed, formulated like how I ran my ops and and did what I had to do. I, I appreciate that, man. And, and it's I'm sitting here just with you know grinning because uh, I come from Appalachian myself, and I know a lot of our uh, community comes from hard conditions. But the reason I ask the question, man, is and I think it's important is I think you know people they see you on that that series talking about what you did and it does a great job of breaking it down and showing what's possible uh when you demonstrate audacity and human connection and we'll get into that in a minute i know ben has some questions specifically around that but i just one of the first things i wanted to uh put out there because when i talked to you and you and i we grew up in the same group but i um i don't think i ever had the chance to work with you but what what strikes me is that when 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 you talk and and when you where you come from is it it is the place that so many of us come from right and and not just geographically but also you know just at, at a human level you know where where you you are that scrawny kid trying to figure it out not a lot of um not a lot of confidence and 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 trying to just make sense of the world and not sure if you're up to the task and feeling like an imposter sometimes and having to overcome all those things um i just I guess I appreciate the humility in that because I think it makes what you've done with your life even more compelling is the fact that you did come from those places. You did have to move through those things. And I think a lot of people watching this are, are those young people or are those people in their own place in the civilian world where they're going, yeah, I mean, Gary did that in Afghanistan, but I could never pull something as audacious as that off in my business or in my nonprofit. But the reality is, um, you just you can it, it's just you got to dig in and you got to go to those places where you feel those insecurities and still move through it how did you how did you do that i mean because i know that that you had to work through stuff like what was that like um did you find yourself even in the latter years of your career still facing kind of those internal challenges and that feeling of resistance when you take on those big tasks um well you know the risk is one thing you get after you get used, and, and I believe both of you have done this before, once you get used to risking your life, um, you understand that. It's a calculation. Here's my training. Here's my practice. Here's my abilities. So I'm gonna, I can take those. I can rely on those. Um, yeah, the other things about insecurities and all, those are inside. Put me in front of bad guys. Drop me in a place that's dangerous. Hey, I'm at home now. I'm I'm operating on all cylinders. I'm, I'm ready. I can deal with it. 
and you know, the, the funny part is because the worst thing that can happen is death. Once you accept that, that I'm risking death, not that we want it, but you make those calculated risks. How many times did you make an infill or go around a corner where you said, inshallah, you know, I don't know what's going to be around this corner, but if God wills it, you know, I'm, I'm going around the corner. Um, and those, that, those environments, I, I think that was easy and, and taking risk. Like after I became a CIA officer, the risks are very different than they were when I was a special forces soldier, but I still had that same willingness to risk my life. And I had that experience of dealing with, with, uh, in combat zones and in with people that might want to kill you. So I just translated that into my CIA career. Now it's true that that's not what a normal case officer does, but Hey, you know, you have to be who you are and based on your experience. So that, I mean, that's how I ran my ops. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Ben, I'll throw it over to you, man. How, how was it different, the, the risk you were taking uh, between Green Beret and then becoming a case officer? Well, to be honest, as a case officer, it's less risk. Most people, it's a very mundane, like even in a war zone, a case officer gets a week of weapons training. Okay, we, we all know what does a week of weapons training do? You know, in, in that young case officer's mind, uh, it means, yeah, I'm, I'm capable, but to someone with yours and Scott's experience, uh, it means, you know, enough to know how to make a weapon safe, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we're not to point it. So, um, so the risk is different. Um, I, I, you know, like in the, in the episode of spy ops that, that was featured in for this series, yeah, I, I did things that other case officers didn't because other case officers don't have the experience to deal with an enemy. And I was kind of allowed to do that because all the people in charge at the CIA knew me from either combat in uh, Afghanistan 2001, 2002, when I was in a very different combative role. So you were... Or- in Afghanistan, two thousand one, with an ODA in November, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I was in Afghanistan in November, um, all the way through April of two thousand two. Um, so, and then I went to Iraq and was uh, in, you know, the in do, doing ops into Iraq from two thousand two to two thousand four. So, the agency folks in charge knew me from that. So they kind of turned a blind eye and let me try things that uh, they normally wouldn't let a case officer do. It's interesting to hear you say that you feel like the risk uh, as a case officer was lower than it was as a Green Beret, because as a Green Beret, you're there with a team. Most of the work you did as a case officer, you were kind of solo, right? Like almost Jack Ryan-esque? You're solo, but in the ops I did... um, there was participation and help from ground branch guys who are mostly former uh, special operations guys. Uh, And then uh, at times by GRS or global response staff, which are the essentially, you know, the bodyguards for case officers like I was supposed to be. Um, And they're the guys that took you in out uh, in an armored car. They provided your security so you could do your job. Uh, now, most of them also are former um, special operations people, so. Got it. So how did that transition go from special forces to now you're recruited into the CIA? For me, um, later in my military career, like beginning 98, I started doing some classified projects in the Middle East um, and in in those projects like in Yemen and Kuwait, I coordinated with and cooperated with the agency 
okay. to achieve some military objectives. And so they got to know me. And uh, then in 2001, the Army or John Mulholland, commander of Task Force Dagger, directed me to be on four different agency teams in those early days. Um, <laughs> So the agency got to know me and then right. I was loaned from the army to the agency from my last part of my career, 2002 to 2004 to do um, the tactical portion of a cross border thing from Kuwait into Iraq. So uh, I got to know more agency people at that point. I came back the stop loss that the military had had which prevented people from retiring was just ended. And the agency gave me a chance to, you know, join the agency. So I, you know, I jumped on it. Gotcha. Um, in, in the episode of Spies, Taliban Spies, there's a, a Pan Shiri linguist uh, who also worked with the agency. How important were your relationships with locals like Russell? And also, I'm curious, since he is Panshiri, did you know him from your 2001, 2002 deployment? Or did he just happen to come into Kabul and, and you guys had kind of walked a similar path leading up to that? Yeah, so I met uh, Rasul and uh, the, there was a, the agency had a bank of linguists and you know, the three I most often worked with over, I, I spent three years. I, so I was in Afghanistan as a soldier, 2001 and two, and then as a CIA officer, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, and during that time, I worked primarily with Rasul, a guy named John, and another guy named Cher. And no, I had not met him before. Like I didn't meet Rasul, even though he was a Panjshiri. Um, but I, I met him when we worked out of the Ariana hotel. And then since I, the linguist continually rotated there. And since I stayed three years, I got to know them better than most people cause, uh, a, a tour for a CIA officer is a year in a war zone. And, uh, they, they, uh, decided I, sh I should do three tours. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's funny you bring up the Ariana Hotel uh, during the Neo out of Afghanistan in 2021. That was it's a hotly contested site. It, it seems like Department of State and other agencies, they like that hotel. Well, you know, the agency has never been accused of uh, being short on dollar, <laughs> taxpayer dollars to spend. <laughs> so let's just say it was, uh, it, you know, it was nice. I, I went there. The first time I went there was in early. January 2002, because I joined uh, the Colonel Mulholland sent me to join the team that was going to go infill in the coast. So, hey, just show up at this place called the Ariana Hotel. And, you know, I went there and it, we were just putting up a little bit of barbed wire. It was all, you know, just a messed up old hotel. Well, then I come back as a CIA case officer in uh, later 2005. You know, it's built up quite a bit. And by the time I left in 2008, you know, we went from, you know, a couple dozen people to uh, there's over 700 people, CIA people in Afghanistan. It's a big, giant thing. There's a giant trailer complex, a really nice gym, uh, all kind of things. So, you know, it's just like, hey, Bagram, when the first time I went to Bagram with just some bombed out buildings. And look what that turned into. So you were there five, six, seven, and eight with agency. Scott, weren't you, didn't you overlap some of those years? Yeah, definitely. We, we overlapped. I was with, uh, one seven, uh, doing, you know, more of the FID mission. Um, and, and definitely tread a lot of the same ground, Gary. And as I was watching the, um, the Taliban spies episode, on spy games, I I um I was struck by the the emphasis that you placed on human connection, right? And and you 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 brought it up a lot, 
as you step through the various phases of these engagements, right? And and with with pretty much every constituent you dealt with that were, you know, included some pretty hardcore dudes. Um, but it, 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 it was a constant through line for you. And I know that people may watch that and, you know, kind of have their own preconceived notions of the special ops community or preconceived notions of, you know, case officers in the CIA and, and the way that you approach that and the emphasis that you put on social capital and human connection almost seems foreign in terms of what I think a lot of people think about when they think about interacting with the Taliban or, you know, trying to, you know, move them in a certain direction or, you know, play the sky, the spy game, so to speak. And, 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 and spy ops certainly shed some light on what that looks like. Um, but my question to you is, where did this, you know, you, you, you clearly put a lot of emphasis on human connection. Um, what, what, what was it about human connection that, that served you in those situations? And where did that come from? Like, where did you learn that? Was it something you acquired in, in special forces? I suspect it was, but, but you clearly brought that into the realm as a case officer. So, um, can you, can you speak to that a little bit on that approach? Sure. As long, as long as I don't go for too long, <laughs> um, part of it's your personality, right? I, I like people. I, I care about people's story. I'm horrible at names as a CIA officer. I'll go to some diplomatic function and you're supposed to get everybody's card and meet all the diplomats and try to figure out who's who. I'm horrible at names, but I could come back and describe a person, how they look to a T, tell you everything about their lives and what they said to me. I just won't remember their name. So, yeah, I, I like people and, you know, as as military people, even starting as a Marine, the basics you learn, shoot, move, communicate, physical fitness, courage, you know, never giving up. Those are the things that carry you through. When I became a special forces soldier, it's not that I learned special techniques and became this special person it's that you did the basics with a high degree of skill there's nothing fancy about anybody that does cqb and goes into a building shooting around people it's it still starts with the basics you just learn how to do them very well so and then you know i, I like people so going to special forces and learning you know where it's by, with, and through somebody else, that kind of fit my personality. And let's take, give an example, Tora Bora, you know, we were up there and at one night, the Afghans that were with us up on our observation post said we all had to leave and they had been ordered to leave and they pulled out and left us up there alone. We were really vulnerable and but we stayed. Well, one of the younger SF guys, because we the last guy to leave was this really young interpreter we had. And he said that even if the others wouldn't come back, he would come back to us the next day. And, you know, one of the young SF guys was like, hey, well, you can't do that because I'll shoot you. And, and I said, no, let's figure out uh, – a challenge and, and uh, response that if somebody is trying to re-enter and come back to us, you know, we picked a, a, the word called wana for tree uh, in Pashtun. And, and I said, well, let him do that. And he's, and you know, this young guy was, no, that gives them that second. If somebody comes, I'm shooting them. And that's why I said, wait a minute, we're special forces. So we are supposed to be so good at what we do that we can spare that half of a second to give that person that edge because our mission is through them. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and that's how I believed and how I did a lot of my, even some of the combat ops I did in, uh, with locals in 2001 and two, you know, that I carried that 
with me to the agency. And then you wind up in the agency. Well, here I am in Afghanistan. I, it's not really a robust diplomatic circuit where I can go around to dinner parties and try to recruit some uh, foreign diplomat. I'm a, I'm a soldier through and through. And I know I've been out in the boonies with these guys. So how can I do so? You, I just created ways to capitalize on, on all that past. Yeah. I, I think that's a really great description. And, and I, you know, for folks watching this that, you know, maybe you don't know, Gary alluded to the fact that, um, you know, green berets typically work by with and through, um, indigenous partners. And some of them may be commando. Some of them may be, uh, local villagers, but it, you know, the, the entry, all of the special ops outfits, the Rangers Delta, they all have, these amazingly unique missions, but it, you know, what is very unique to the green beret at, and all the way back to our legacy, Gary, all the way back to the OSS in world war two, you know, they would drop in in these three person teams that were, they called them jet and they would, they would literally stay behind enemy lines until the war was over uh, and build these, these relationships, you know, these, these deep relationships with locals. And then they would mobilize them, to stand up on their own. I used to try to you know, explain it to people that would come to Afghanistan because in 2010, you know, we were doing village stability operations and we had teams led by, you know, iconic NCOs, just like yourself, that they understood this at a fundamental level. They lived it and they were out there in the hinterlands walking around in uh, Afghan garb with beards, speaking the language and, and really immersed in, in local context. And folks would ask me like, you know, why in the world would you do that? And, and the reality is, is that that social capital, those local relationships are often the things that will, I mean, that is your body armor in many cases, when you're dealing with ambiguity and complexity, it is the relationships that you have in those um, tough places. And Ben, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask a follow-up real quick because I think it's, it's important to come in right behind this question, um, which is like, you know, that does make sense, Gary, to a lot of folks when they see that. But when they see you looking, you know, like in spy ops at, at these spies, I mean, literally these people that are coming across the border and and you don't know what their disposition is. Like, there's no way that you truly like there's you're taking a big risk here. You, you, you're doing all the right things to build the connection. But in those moments where it is so edgy, you know, you're sitting across staring from someone at someone who's radically different than you, but yet you still find time, you know, to share your overgarment because that individual's cold. I mean, right. what would you, what would you say to people? Like, it seems to me in the United States, there's so much division in the country and people in business and all the time are looking across at another human that's radically different than them. They see them as a threat. But I mean, we know that if you can build rapport with somebody, even in hostile situations, a lot of times it's better. How the hell do you do it? What do, what is it that goes through Gary Harrington's mind about rapport building when you're across from somebody radically different than you who could be considered an enemy? What is the context and the and the sequence that you go through to first look at rapport as an option? Um. Well, I, I look at rapport as an option. I'm, I'm not sure it's it's the first, because let's be honest, the three of us all have the same background. And, and one thing I carried into these situations was I will build rapport and do my best to do that. But in the end, if it comes to a fight or if I have to, Absolutely. if I have to kill the person, I have to, yeah. there, there are people that I worked with and dealt with a long time. And I thought, gosh, if I had to, uh, I might have to, I'd have to kill this person. And then yeah. it's like I, the way I am, I'd be like, I would deal with that the rest of my life. But if I had to do it, I, I would do it. Absolutely. And, and, and you didn't let security lapse. I mean, I'm not to cut you off, but you know, yeah. you did talk about in the episode that like, you know, you would immediately check and pat down when you would do the hug. And so not, I mean, I guess I'm almost operating on the assumption that, okay, you do that you do the security piece first, but it seemed to me that you moved to rapport quicker than most humans do. Yeah, because rapport is part of leadership. I believe in servant leadership. 
to be yeah. a servant leader, you have to give to people. And even if it's a person that you disagree with, an enemy, uh, a person here that I don't agree with, um, and, and we want to have a disagreement uh, about politics, morality, whatever, that um, you have to be willing to to accept that it's different, but I'm not giving up who I am. And, right. and by me serving them and engaging them, uh, and I think in a, in a way, I mean, we all know how servant leadership, you, you it's like a sacrifice. You give at the beginning and then you get later. You know, yeah. you have to touch that heart. And whether right. it's an Afghan that I'm sharing a blanket with or, a, you know, the two lowest Afghans in an explosive truck. And I say, Hey, I'm going to ride in here with you. And if, if you die, you know, you're the lowest of the low. I'll, I'll go with you. Those. Yeah. It's a risk, but it, but it has its payback at the end. Yeah. When I patted the Taliban coming across the border down, you know, to be honest, that was partly defense. Uh, it was two things. A, I needed to show them I wasn't scared. So no, I didn't wear any body armor or anything like that. And uh, and B, if I screwed up and one of them did want to do an attack, I'd rather them kill me than get to where the team was and kill teammates. We all saw later uh, in 2009 yeah. with the coast bombing where the seven CIA officers were killed, the mistake of letting somebody in with other people and I didn't want the security guys, the ground branch guys handling that responsibility because I, it was my mission and I'm the one that made that call. So yeah. I, I wanted to be the one to take the brunt of it if it went if it went bad. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you. Over to you, Ben. Uh, so for everybody just now tuning in, because this is live, we are here with Gary Harrington, ex-CIA officer and former Special Forces, and Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann, a dear friend of mine. Um, and for everybody that just heard that story about sharing the coat, I want to give you just a little glimpse into how much these guys are overselling what they just did. So Gary used servant leadership and shared an overcoat with a suicide bomber and was actually able to end up flipping the guy. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story and and what made you elect to do that rather than just zip him? Um, these The two suicide bombers believed they were hooking up with a Taliban cell in Kabul that I set up with people I used. And they, they got in, the cell removed the vest from them. And after they kept them there a couple days, got them settled, um, is when they told the story about some reporter that wanted to do their life story and would make them famous. And it kind of fit into how they were brainwashed and what they wanted. So I went to meet them. So you're, oh, you're the reporter. Uh, yeah, I played the reporter. And I, <laughs> I couldn't be American, so I, I claimed I was Canadian. Um, I figure some guy from a village in remote Afghanistan is not going to figure out that my accent isn't quite Canadian. Right. Um, it's I, South Canada, Gary. It's South Canada. <laughs> I threw in a few hays, you know, hey, okay. <laughs> and uh, but um, but we and we were ready. I had the GRS, the Global Response Security guys take me in there and they were dressed, they had blankets like I did over the top of their combat gear. And, you know, I, I had the two suicide bombers in one room of this mud hut. And when I w entered the room, we already had things like, if I, here's what I'm gonna say, if they start to attack me and I'm gonna dive on the ground and they're gonna come in shooting and they were on the other side of that door you know, listening that if I needed help, they were going to kick the door in and uh, and come in shooting. That allowed me the freedom to go in and deal with these guys and talk to them. They were young. They're scared. They're not sure what they're doing. 
So, and it was cold, it's, again, it's a mud hut. And so I took the blanket that I wore on the outside and took it off me and put it around this guy that was shivering. I couldn't just cause he was, he was cold. And then we talk the, you know, the initial talk is always a little bit about yourself, but more about them and just getting them to talk and establish some rapport. At the end of, towards the end of that talk, I got ready to leave. He was very deferential and he was going to give me back the blanket. I told him, no, it's yours. You keep it. Let him keep it, walked away. Of course, later I get a report from the Afghans I had running that safe house that when they talked to him, he, he said, wow, I, we, you know, we were taught all Westerners are really bad, evil people. That guy was nice. It was a good thing he was Canadian, though, and he wasn't an American. So, <laughs> of course, they were supposed to kill the <laughs> American. But so th these two guys, they showed up with vests. Their their mission was to blow up Westerners, and you ended up gaining their trust and and getting them to tell you basically all about their background. At right. first, under false pretenses that you were a Canadian reporter. Did they ever find out you were an American? When you talk to people. For a while, you, you talk, then you start asking specifics about their training, how they were selected, what they went through, what they did. Well, then you always want to ask questions if they can identify people that will lead you up the chain. When you start asking specific questions, I think for most people, it becomes obvious you're not just interested in, in their life story and writing a book. Plus, um, we, I wanted at, at some point I needed to come clean with them because I wanted to use them to uh, as in a, like a public relations campaign run by the Afghan Intel Service to try to show how regular people could be brainwashed and their lives thrown away for no reason and show the folly of that. So I did eventually say, hey, I'm not a Canadian, I'm an American, and I work for CIA, you know, but that's after like three or four meetings. So, but I'm at that point of, I know that they have some respect and care for me that we've made a connection so that the truth They'll have that to weigh with, oh, American CIA, we're supposed to kill him. But they'll have how I have treated them over those last three or four meetings and what I have done for them to weigh against that. And my bet was it would come out in my favor. And you bet right. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. Scott, Scott mentioned at the beginning of this call uh, the importance of human connection, particularly in hostile or uncertain environments. I think that isn't just, I can't think of a better example of that in action right there. Um, it seems like so much of, of what we did in Afghanistan and obviously what special forces do in general revolves around human connection, leveraging partner nation forces, building alliances and trust. It, could you have done any of what your job required of you without your partner nation forces in Afghanistan? No. <laughs> no, you can't. And and even later, you know, later in my CIA career, I was able to run a couple ops, plan a couple ops where we took out some senior, very senior Al-Qaeda Al personnel. As a, but everything we do in CIA, I, it's, it's more of the by, with, and through, right? And uh, we throw in the mix of some sophisticated electronic devices that can help you but that's the skill it's not me being a sniper or me being an assaulter that could put me in in front of a senior al-qaeda guy i'm never going to get anywhere near him you know not not counting the the raid that got bin laden that's a that's a very one-off thing but um 
Well, even there, a lot of human connection. Yeah, uh, the, so it's got to be a human connection because by, with, and through, while that's really the mantra of special forces, that's really how CIA does its job too. So collectively, how, how many calendar years did you spend in Afghanistan, <clears throat> partner nation forces? I think I've got, um, so three years plus five months. So probably three years and five months. Um, That's not an insignificant amount of time. Um, and I want to ask you a personal uh, question. So in August of 21, when the collapse happened, how did that hit you on a personal level? It is hard. Uh, if you look in the, um, as the episode seven of spy ops, Taliban spies closes, there's a picture of me with some Afghans there. I personally recruited, selected and trained every Afghan there. And I worked with them by myself in a, in a compound. Um, we shared everything together. I joined officers, enlisted. We became like a family. They called me Ustad. And for those of you that have served in Afghanistan, that means professor. And it's an honorific title, meaning they, they feel you're compassionate and wise. And um, it, it was an honor to be called that at first I like, well, I don't, what do you mean professor? And, uh, but I was very close to them and other Afghans that I had risked my life for. And they, there were times I gave my life over to them. So now what happens and what happens to all those people? And unfortunately with U S politics, that's the way it goes. Yeah. We left people in Panama that I that risked themselves to help me. And I've often wondered, I wonder if they paid a price after we were pulled out in country after country. You know, somebody helps you. Is it because we have money? Um, is it because we have the might of air power? Um, and then what happens when you leave? And, and I think that's where Scott part of the, that human connection comes in because I, I want to know that it wasn't just the money and I didn't just give money and it wasn't the threat of what we could do militarily that there was some of me that was left with that person. I, I honestly gave them part of me. I, we may leave and, and I, I feel horrible about leaving and leaving people hanging, um, you know, but, but that's part of it is that, you know, you have in the, in the roles we played, it's one of the things that you have to come to terms with that it's, if we had it to, if I had it to choose, it wouldn't be that way, but there are other people that get to make those decisions. Yeah. I'm positive we've got, uh, actually, I know for a fact, we've got a number of Afghans downrange watching this live right now, uh, including some representatives of the NRF uh, and uh, countless people that worked uh, the EVAC out of Afghanistan that are still working the EVAC out of Afghanistan. Anything you want to say to them? Uh, any advice as, as far as a path forward, what they can do? Yeah, I do. Hey, first of all, you have to survive. You have to uh, do whatever it takes to stay active and to stay alive. The Taliban will never maintain absolute control. In 2001, we had the momentum, we had the power, we knocked them off their, uh, the top of the hill. And now they're gonna find how hard it is to maintain so George Washington, why he was our greatest leader when we against the British, wasn't that he was won the most victories and battles. 
he learned when to maintain and when to hold and when to survive and when to wait till the time and the resources were right before he took the actions in Trenton that led to the United States defeating the Brits. So you have to do that right now. No, it looks bad. You may feel that the U S is more than willing to on the government level to leave you behind and embrace something else. But there are real people like Scott and Ben and many, many others that do understand you and want to help you. So, you know, we can't do a whole lot at this point, but survive, keep it going and wait. And people will be at your side. It may take a long time. It's well said. Very well said. Scott, you got any follow up to that or you want to pivot off of a depressing topic and talk more about human connection and what we can do at that state side? No, I think I think there is a because I think this is necessary. And I think the just one follow up I'll ask to that, um, you know, Gary, I, I was listening to you talk about how, you know, we've 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 left people. And, you know, as a fellow Green Beret, you know, I was trained, taught and conditioned that that is not just, you know, those aren't just platitudes. That's how you live your life. Like you, you are expected to go into these places and you are expected to build these relationships, social capital, and then leverage it in some way that, as you said, I mean, you've actually left part of yourself with these human beings. And, and then the odds are they're going to do things that they would otherwise never do because of those relationships. And in many cases, lose their lives or, or whatever. And, you know, there's two points. One is, is, is I just want to build on something you said. Um, if, you, if, you, if you watched the first episode in PsyOps, you know, you had the jawbreaker guys to include one of my men, Doc Phillips, you know, who spent how much of his life in that country? I mean, my God. And, and then at the end, I just loved it. He goes, 20 years, chump. 20 years for what? You know, and, and I just think it, 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 I know I stood up and just let out a yell because that's how so many people feel. And you're right. I mean, the policymakers, the politicians, they get to make these decisions. And I'm, and I'm not interested in taking that on here. And I know you're not either. But the reality is we are developing a, a systemic multi-generational habit of leaving our allies in the dust. And that will come around and haunt us at some point or put a young Green Beret in a tenuous position when he tries to make a connection in another place and they just raise their eyebrow and they say, Afghanistan, you know? And, and so I do hope any policymakers or, you know, senior leaders are paying attention to this because it ain't like you get a human connection mulligan, you know, every time you do this, like there's a con. But what I would ask of you, Gary, now that I've kind of made that little statement on the heels of what you said is a lot of our men and women who served in special forces, who served in special ops, who served in the intelligence community, even some dip, dip development experts and folks like Ben, that's where that was in the Afghanistan evacuation. And, you know, they're sitting around right now trying to make sense of what is really a violation of everything they were taught. And, you know, it is I've been touring the country with this play that we're doing, trying to help heal and just restore. And I am seeing levels of um, impact that I've never seen before. And um, what would you say to the men and women who fought and served in Afghanistan, Iraq, in these post 9-11 environments, only to see it end as abruptly as it did end in this kind of callous policy world, what would you say to them about their service and what's going through their mind right now? First of all, I'd say it's, it's not about the end results. When we look back at our time, it's how did you do every day when you were on the ground? How did you treat every interaction? And you served a noble cause, whether it was because of the 
men and women on your left and right, whether it was for the kids in that Afghan village, the women that you wanted to empower to be able to go to school again, the ability of people to listen to music again. Um, it was worthwhile. It was noble. You can't look at what other people have decided or these end results to look back and gauge what was your worth? What was, what was it? No, I disagree with Chump, you know, 20 years Chump, because who each of any of you are today is based in part on what you did then. And what you did then was based on who you are as a person. So we have nothing to be ashamed of as individuals for what we did. You know, uh, just to, I think an, an incident that exemplifies what you said, Scott, was that at one point with these same Taliban guys, we were on a on the border up between Nangahar and I believe Kanduz, uh, right on the Pakistan border. And in, in uh, like five or six ground branch guys, myself, in a very remote place, and we were trying to meet a, we thought we were gonna get a most wanted Taliban guy surrendered to us. And we got up there to this village, we moved in the middle of the night in uh, unarmored vehicles, and the guy didn't show. Now we're trapped in a village, I, I'm, not be, I'm not able to make comms from there. The Afghan general with me goes forward into Pakistan to see if he can scope things out and see what's going on. He doesn't come back at the time I gave him. Well, now it's getting later in the morning. We're in a really bad place. By now, I know that Taliban and Al Qaeda know we're there and would be maneuvering to, to do an ambush. And the big decision I had was I knew that the United States and the CIA, if I asked them the correct answer is for me to get my butt out of there with the Americans, save American lives and get out. But I've got that Afghan that trusted me and am I gonna leave him? And so it, it, to be honest, it was a really, it, it really bothered me a lot because A, to get him, I kind of have to illegally cross into Pakistan so that was a consideration, right? You know, I might be causing an international incident. Certainly in the CIA, it's a career ending choice if that goes badly. Um, and then I'm putting Americans at further risk for an Afghan. So what do you do? And to any people in the resistance out there, Ultimately, and consulting with the ground branch guys, you got to give them all, all the credit. Hey, we decided, you know what? He might be an Afghan, but he's our partner and we're going after him. And we called up, you know, the reaction force, like 12 Afghans um, in pickup trucks from 30 minutes away. And off we rolled in to Pakistan and, uh, and we, we encountered the general, he'd been running, he'd had a run in with a Pakistani checkpoint and had been running and, and, and we, we linked up with him. And then we were all able to reverse and get out with nobody hurt. But it was a thing of, I'm sure that that went against the policy and I'm sure it went against what CIA headquarters, Washington, D.C., what anybody would say, but that is that shared human connection. So many of your listeners have that human connection. So to the Afghans out there, trust me, there are many other people more than willing, and as you've seen with Ben and his friends, uh, willing to go and put themselves at risk to help people. Yeah, that's really great. And I, you know, I, the only thing I'll add, Gary, is that I think when Doc said that about 20 years chump, I think he was lumping all of the policymakers and politicians into that category and, and speaking on behalf 
of a lot of us who who did exactly what you said, who, yeah. who poured ourselves into that country, did what we were asked, um, and then the response was so cavalier. Um, but uh, Ben, I'm going to throw it over to you. I mean, you you kind of hinted at a great, I think, last question to land on um, as we kind of wrap the the the, the spy ops piece for this one with Gary, which is what can people at home, you know, take away? But I'll let you frame it, and and uh, I'm just. Gary, I'm honored to have spent time with you. You too, Scott. Likewise, Gary, this has been just an absolutely awesome conversation. We appreciate your time today. And uh, Scott, I was actually going to throw that same question back over to you. So from my perspective, you know, <clears throat> Gary just illustrated some insane examples of the power of human connection, leveraging relationships and a willingness to step into harm's way and throw the status quo to the wind to get some amazing things done in an incredibly hostile environment with people that, I mean, for all intents and purposes, were your enemy. Um, if that works over there in a war, I think we'd be crazy to think it won't work here at home. Um, everybody watching, you hear Scott and I talk about this all the time. Uh, we've got as, as Americans, as humans, to stop focusing on the things that divide us and realize that at the end of the day, I think we, we all really want the same thing. We just have different beliefs about how we get there. We want to live our lives, to run our businesses, to raise our families with minimal interference from the government or bureaucracy. Um, if you look at all of the things you've seen Scott and I do, uh, whether it's the Afghan evac, Ukraine, fighting human trafficking, Task Force Lahaina, responding to fires, responding to natural disasters, there's one thing kind of as the focus, we want to remove, remove bureaucracy from the equation and get things done at a grassroots level as quickly as possible, uh, because that's where you can be nimble when you're not having to deal with the powers that be when institutional leadership, as Scott loves to say, is not going to show up. Who does that leave? It, it leaves us. It leaves the people at the bottom and, and bottom up solutions are always going to be the best way to solve the problems that are plaguing society. And let's be real, we have a lot of problems in our society today. We have a host of calamities affecting us. Uh, you know, my focus is around addiction, alcoholism, homelessness, inner city violence, and human trafficking, and they all kind of go hand in hand. Um, and I think at the same time, they're all driven by people attempting to fill a void within them with uh, vices. And, you know, I choose to attack that at a very grassroots, bottom-up level, uh, and I leverage human connection to do it. Uh, and it's working. And I think there are a lot of parallels here. Gary, you, you mentioned that we can't focus on, on how that 20 year war ended, that everybody that took part in it did what they had to do. They showed up that, that really resonated with me because we can't control outcomes and this work that we're doing in South Memphis or, or all over the United States, we can't control outcomes. All we can do is show up, stand people up, build alliances and networks and, and raise the voices of the people getting the work done. At the end of the day, it is up to them. You can think of them as our partner nation forces to do the work. They live on these streets, right? I, you know, I live out here in the country in Georgia. I get to come home at the end of the week. Um, Scott, I have ADHD and I'm rambling, but I think you can summarize what I'm trying to say there. <laughs> Yeah, I would just say, Gary, what would you say to folks watching this that, you know, again, they 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 they've watched spy ops, they're they're seeing these amazing Herculean missions that have happened. But the stuff that you got done, you really got done with basic leadership principles that you just did very well. Do you see any correlations here at home? Is there anything as a parting shot? What would you say to Americans who are watching this? What can they take from this? What can they take from your three and a half years in that country and those all of those things that you did, what would you say to them as a parting shot to bring some of those lessons home? Hey, my, my, I am a conservative person and philosophically and the, the things that I believe in. And I think conservatives feel frustrated now because what do conservative people do by the nature of a conservative where you want to kind of maintain status quo to some extent when things got hard or new policies came down let's say 10 years ago 15 years ago that we didn't like what do you do well as a conservative person you tend to roll up your sleeves tighten your belt and make accommodations because you go 
I can still do it. I'll work a little longer. I'll cut, uh, cut this out and you make do. We back up because we don't want to be confrontational. Now we found ourselves to a point where so much is changing and the language is changing and people now can, we have a generation that believes that what they say is true. It doesn't matter what is true or what is natural or what reality says, but that if I speak it, it's my truth and therefore it's everyone's truth. So it's easy. We've got all these people that want to point at conservatives and our last president and say how evil and wrong they are. But many people I talk to on the conservative side are kind of the same way. And it's so easy to want to point a finger. You're evil. You're satanic. This is immoral and wrong. And yeah, there are things, there is evil in the world. Those things are wrong. But instead of pointing our fingers at each other, I mean, that person in the pew next to you at church might vote different than you on the next presidential election, but they're there on their knees to worship the same God you are. And we need to start pointing not at each other like this, but pointing to something else, something above us, beyond us, whether that is um, a, a, a belief, a cause, a, your faith. Those are the things that we need to do. You know, I, I, I think I told a story to you guys when we talked about an argument with an Afghan commander that I'd been in a, uh, opposite sides of a battle in 2002 in. And then he was arguing with me about how the U.S. abandoned the Taliban after the 80s and all this. So basically, it was our fault that we were there. And in the end, I said, OK, look, you tried to kill me in 2002. I tried to kill you. It wasn't successful. Are we going to continue? Do you want to fight this out and see who can kill who? Or should we see what we can do together and, and go do that? And he decided that we should do that. I feel that we now need to do that with the people that we may not agree with. And, and it's hard. You have to give up something. But I think that if we can get to the point where we can have those conversations, both sides could realize if we give up just a little bit, there's something we both get in return. Well, I, I tell you, Ben, I think that's right where it, to leave it. Um, it's so yes. well said, Barry. And I just want to point out to listeners and viewers, this is a Marine, a Green Beret, and a case officer with three and a half years in Afghanistan alone of combat. That's not counting Iraq, Colombia, and all the other crazy places uh, he worked. Um, and yet he, um, this is what he's saying, is if you catch yourself thinking, as Sebastian Younger says, of contempt for your neighbor or moral superiority over another human, um, you're probably in a position where you're at a disadvantage or where we're going down the wrong path. Again, this, is a, this isn't coming from a kumbaya, I'm okay, you're okay kind of dude. This is a dude that has probably seen more combat than most humans alive, and that's the position. And I think it's just such a good place to leave it. And I think it's why, Gary and Ben, I think our veterans, our military family members, and our first responders, we really need to pay attention to them because they're they're illuminating the moral compass we need to follow here at home. They're looking yeah. at what's going on. They're living their lives in a way that if we just pay attention to them, look at how Gary's living his life now. Look at how he's taking these lessons now that the guns have gone silent over there and he's bringing them home. There's so much to learn, man. There's so much to learn and apply here at home. So much simplicity and elegance in what you just said about how to live your life and lead Gary. I'm, I'm super grateful for it. So I, I, I think we leave it there, Ben. And, and I think because at home, so I'll throw it over to you. Yep. I love it. At the end of the day, we're all just broken people trying to find our way in this world. And uh, I don't think there's any argument that we're stronger together. 
On that note, you guys got to check out Spy Ops on Netflix. It's currently in the top 10. Gary is one of the stars of the Taliban Spies episode. Real life Jack Ryan, awesome guy. Appreciate your time so much, Gary. Scott, as always, it's been a pleasure, man. You guys have a good one. Take Take care. care.